is particularly timely. The case for new homes, including affordable housing, is all too well known, and the coronavirus pandemic has brought the need to build more and better into sharp focus. Recent research conducted by Savills for Shelter estimates that 84,000 fewer homes will be built this year because of the pandemic. This is at a time when home means so much more than before. So many community housing groups have played a central role in providing support for their communities during the pandemic. And they're now poised and ready to play a major role in helping the economy to recover and to build back better. The government's investment in the Community Housing Fund has catalyzed hundreds of new housing projects in all parts of the country, including in some of the left behind places. There are now 10,780 homes live applications on the Homes England system that groups are ready to get working on as soon as the Community Housing Fund is renewed. The fund has more than trebled that total pipeline of community-led homes across England. A significant increase and one which, if I'm honest, I don't think we ever imagined would be quite as great as it is. So I think that really shows the passion and commitment of communities to take this work. These homes are critical. A critical source of contract for SME builders, helping them to stay in business and providing a much needed boost to local economies. And as we'll hear today, these are homes that wouldn't otherwise be built because community-led housing groups are frequently able to overcome local opposition to new housing or willing to develop sites which mainstream developers deem to be unsuitable and too challenging to even try. And the homes they provide are beautiful, often built to very high environmental standards and frequently using modern methods of construction. And I can testify that the the commitment of these groups to what they're wanting to achieve is absolutely inspirational. So they tick so many of the government's boxes. And that's why there is a commitment in the Conservative Manifesto to supporting community-led housing. What we now need, though, is for the government to deliver on that manifesto commitment by renewing the Community Housing Fund in the forthcoming Comprehensive Spending Review so that together we can build, build, build. Yeah. And what better way to make that case than to have evidence to prove that investing in the sector represents high value for money. The research we're launching today provides what those who dedicate hundreds of hours to community housing projects have long known that the benefits outweigh the cost. So I'm delighted that today we're launching this important research and with such a distinguished audience. So first we're going to hear from Danny Kruger, MP, on why the government should support community housing. And we're then going to hear from Grant Cohen, sorry, <laughs> Cohen from Capital Economics launching the report followed by Dr. Tom Archer giving a brief update on the pipeline and the funding required by the sector. Um, and then we'll go back to Danny Kruger, MP, who will provide some initial reflections, followed by invited MPs and peers to invite their comments and reflections. At the end, as Sophie said, we'll have a chance for a question and answer session. And I ask you to start putting your questions in that chat feature on the Zoom function throughout the event. So without further ado, can I please pass over to Danny Kruger, MP, um, and invite you to give your, your views. Thank you. Thanks very much. And very good to be with you all. I am honoured to be asked. I'm a huge uh, fan of this movement and think that, as I'll explain, I think there's an enormous opportunity for the community housing uh, agenda. Uh, I really look forward to the discussion on the research. In my uh, conversations with government, uh, you know, I, I get the impression there is genuine support and recognition of the value of community housing to communities the question is its value to the taxpayer and that's where the anxiety obviously is so we need this research is extremely timely it's exactly what's needed and uh, very much hope that we can get it to you know lodge it in the treasury's brain uh, in the run-up to the spending review and the decision around the community housing fund so uh 
let me try and give a bit of a political context to it and where I think this fits into uh, the sort of broader question about what's going on. Um, uh, I, I mean, this is my radical perspective. I think there's a revolution underway in our, across the West in our visions of, of the economy and of society. And we are seeing the end of a 40-year economic and social model that has delivered enormous benefits in so many ways uh, and yet uh, has ultimately failed in its original idea that as we, we de-industrialized, labor and capital would flow naturally to meet each other. So people would, who coming from towns where the industry had disappeared would move to places where there was work and conversely capital would uh, flow into these places where labor and land were suddenly cheap and th therefore there would be a natural meeting and uh, prosperity for all uh, for both people and places it's happened to a degree but to an insufficient one and speaking of degrees uh, people without them have been those who've suffered and i think the recent electoral events the referendum and then the general election we just had in the last year are, 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 the, are very obviously uh, represent a revolutionary uh, moment in which people from the places that have been left behind have rejected that model and they want a different one and that's what this government is committed to delivering because we found that places are quite sticky people don't want to leave them just in the prospect of a distant uh, an opportunity for some economic benefit in a distant place they've got attachments and relationships and affections for the places that they're from and and capital doesn't seem to flow downhill in the way that people thought it would either it wants it only flows to places where uh, there are there's the infrastructure and by that I also mean the social infrastructure that makes places livable and attractive to businesses so we've rediscovered place that's what's going on and uh, it's this rather glorious sort of absurd almost satiric uh uh moment we're in that 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 in in westminster and whitehall we've discovered the existence of geographical communities and are now trying to base base policy around them, which is a very good recognition to have finally arrived at uh and and for me i think this is part of a general rejection of the big large remote forces in the commercial economy or in the public sector and people don't want to be under remote bureaucracies but they don't want to be alone either so i think there's a cultural trip change going on and uh, and we've seen this in recent months a, a distrust and a, and a general skepticism about the ability of big systems uh, nationally managed systems whether public publicly managed or privately to deliver uh, the uh, the responsiveness that's needed to the coronavirus crisis uh, but we've seen people coming together locally and, and spontaneously and as it were organically uh, often with the support of local businesses and local authorities local councils in the most amazing way um, and that's the report that I've written for government which is coming out tomorrow um, uh, uh, that's what that's about so these old ideas of place and community are back um, I think we have this new paradigm of community power that needs to be recognized and adopted by our our rulers and uh you know I, I think this paradigm expresses itself in all sorts of interesting ways uh in in the new movement around social enterprise but also in different models of public services uh in in all sorts of ways i've done a lot of work in the in justice and uh offender rehabilitation uh in every big public policy area the community power is the missing piece of the puzzle and housing does feel like the perhaps the most important and the most obvious. So I first came across community-led housing and, and community land trust in particular when I was working in the White City area of West London in the big housing estate there and uh, supporting families and young people and just recognised the degree to which the residents of that estate had so little power over the millions and millions of pounds of public money that is spent on them and for them and around them. Uh, but never buy them in any meaningful sense and 
and really this I realized how much this came back to their tenancies and their and the tenure that they had as as very transient uh, and very disempowered residents of this place so we got interested in 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 the notion of, of, of community ownership and uh, got to know the great hero of Walston and Elgin, Jonathan Rosenberg. I don't know if he's on the call or not, but the hero of uh, WETCH, the Walston and Elgin Community Housing Association, which basically took over these two estates in North Westminster back in the 80s and 90s after a long battle with Westminster Council. Um, and Jonathan effectively you know, declared UDI and uh, set up the Independent Republic of Walton and Elgin. Um, he, he showed me around it once and told me where he'd like to cite the machine guns and the passport uh, uh, stations to keep the keep the council out. Um, so uh, Walton and Elgin basically assumed control of its own land and is now its own, you know, tenants are their own landlords in effect. And it's the most brilliant place. And they've not only restored and improved the housing really dramatically there, but they are, they've, in te they've, in, they've densified the estate more. They've, by, by public consent uh, of residents, have built more housing, which is not what you know, we, we're used to people doing. So they wanted more housing in their own estate. Uh, there's lots to be said about uh, urban community-led housing, but um, I'll just finish with a word about what's happening in Wiltshire, which is where I'm an MP now. And, and of course, CLTs began, as I understand it, as a rural housing solution in Scotland 100 years ago. Uh, and, they're, and they're particularly well suited to, to the challenge of finding new housing in rural areas. Lots of schemes in the Southwest, uh, many supported by um, housing associations and developers for community led housing and, uh, and community land trusts. Right now, of course, we're all digesting this white paper. Um, a quick word on that. I mean, we obviously do need more housing. I don't think we talk enough about the demand for housing and why that's ultimately the issue that needs addressing, um, which is, as I understand it is, you know, a third of it is driven by the effects of immigration and a third of it is driven by the effects of family, uh, family formation, family breakdown in, in, in a nutshell. And, and you know, what used to be a house of multiple generations now, you know, people living alone and apart. Um, uh, but we do need more homes and uh, and where to put them is the question. The white paper sets out this very ambitious vision for more, much more, much stronger neighbourhood planning. And I really support that, you know, much more local decisions on design, great emphasis on beauty. But obviously we need these neighbourhood plans to have real bite, unlike neighbourhood plans currently. And uh, that, uh, and we need less of the appeal system, which basically ends up with most developments being decided in London. So. I think community housing is the way through. It's the way to square the circle on more housing that people actually want locally. Uh, in Great Bedwin, a village near me in Wiltshire, there's an opportunity for dozens of new housing. The, the, the village wants it. Uh, it'll keep the school going, make the school viable. It'll mean the teachers from the school have somewhere they can't even buy in the, their own village at the moment. They can't live in their own village or the village that they're working in. It means people's children can live there. There's a huge amount of support here, but only if the parish itself controls the housing. That is the condition that they, they're putting on this. So they do not want to be given an arbitrary number by the government or the council and then some big developer come in and build a whole bunch of horrible housing uh, that they have no say in the allocations of or, or the design of. So so the way to build get the housing we need is, is this model. I think, and I read that there's 23,000 homes in the pipeline uh, for community housing, which is Great, it's a very good number, but we need 300,000 homes a year, apparently. So we need to up that number. And so I am with you on the absolute need to revive the Community Housing Fund. I'm pushing hard for that. I very much support this campaign and that work. But as I say, the, the, the challenge is demonstrating to the Treasury that there is real bang for the taxpayer's buck if we do that. So I'm, I'm very much uh, supportive of that. I look forward to the discussion around this research. Thank you. Danny, thank you very much. And that was a really helpful political context. And yes, place shaping is a really useful way of looking at it in terms of this being urban, rural, suburban. It's a model that works in communities wherever they are. Um, and I think the important thing now is actually to be able to express that both in terms of that qualitative information, but also in terms of much more quantitative in terms of the value for money. And at that point, I'd like to um, hand over to Grant Cahoon, please, who's going to tell us a little bit about the research um, that you've just completed. So Grant, over to you.
Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Right. Yes. Sorry, let me just uh, press various buttons and we'll get there. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me and see uh, some slides. Yes, good, I, I can see a nodding head, that's a, a good start. Okay, um, so thanks very much. I know we've only got a very brief time uh, this morning. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here with you to tell you about the work around community-led housing, which um, you know, it's really good to hear Danny's introduction. And you know, it's really, um, for, for someone, a researcher like me, to know sort of exactly how this fits into the bigger scheme of things it is, you know, it's really, um, it's really good to hear and hopefully we can help uh, make a difference and um, contribute to getting the uh, Community Housing Fund uh, restarted. Um, so today, um, there are sort of three key points I think um, I'd like you to take away. Well, four key points possibly. The first one, um, it's, it's Cahoon. Um, I know it causes multiple problems um, everywhere I go. Um, if you do ever come across the name again, it's Cahoon. Um, that aside, the three most important um, key points uh, for today, um, it's additionality, affordability, um, and well-being. Now, these are the three sort of key features, if you like, of community-led housing, at least from the point of view of the value for money um, analysis uh, that we've been doing. So, um, so what do I mean uh, by those three things? Well, first of all, additionality, um, and this is really important, especially if you're looking at it from um, a sort of treasury um, point of view and wanting to um, access increased funding. Uh, there's a key point here around um, this uh, additional housing um, community um, led uh, housing um, delivers homes that just wouldn't otherwise be delivered by the market or, or other developers um, and they do that through um, uh, various means um, it's through you know, local knowledge uh, and engagement um, and it's through you know um, in many cases by by persistence um, and what, what uh, in effect, what, what uh, community-led uh, um, housing groups are doing is um, developing sites that just wouldn't other by, otherwise be developed because they're either not accessible to other developers or they're just not attractive to other developers. Um, in, the, in the survey that we conducted as part of the research, we asked groups um, why the site they are developing or plan, planning to develop hadn't previously been developed and so the uh, results of that are shown in, in the chart here. Um, just pulling out some of the you know, highlights uh, from that, essentially what we're seeing is that uh, around you know, a quarter of the sites uh, have not been developed because they haven't been available before. Um, so quite often um, groups are identifying sites and then through um, through their, their work and efforts, getting those sites, um, uh, getting access to those sites. So for example, um, having land um, gift to them, granted to them um, by local authorities, which otherwise would have uh, lain um, uh, unused, undeveloped. But they're also picking up sites, which I say, which are either just too small or too awkward and therefore too expensive to be uh, attractive to other developers. So, so community-led housing, which, and this is really important, um, it's not displacing other housing that would have been built um, without the groups. It is, it is bringing new housing, uh, additional housing uh, to market. And, and as we heard earlier, there is a, a severe shortage of housing um, across England. So that's the first point, additionality. Uh, the second um, really important point is that, yes, uh, yes, there's a shortage of housing uh, in England um, and in particular, there's a shortage of affordable housing. Um, and there is you know, uh, some generally sort of wide agreements around the, the shortage of housing and particularly the shortage of um, affordable housing. And if we look at the, the pipeline of work of, of homes that are uh, planned, um, at least for those that uh, we know the planned tenure, or uh, yes, we know the planned tenure. And what we see is that for homes in the community led housing pipeline, um, over a, a fifth of those are planned to be social rent homes. Now, social rent homes are you know, the lowest. Uh, the lowest um, cost uh, you know, for, for residents uh, type, of, type of housing. So that share of over a fifth is far higher than, um, than the share for homes 
being developed um, with grants uh, from Homes England and, and Greater the Greater London Authority of Affordable Homes being developed there. So um, community-led housing groups are really doing their best to target um, homes for those that are most in need, um, you know, to make the homes uh, the most affordable they can do uh, within their own sort of financing uh, constraints. Um, and an important point to add on to this uh, point about affordability is that um, generally groups are aiming to develop homes that are going to remain affordable in perpetuity, um, often through uh, because of, sort of legal sort of covenants that uh, ensure that that will remain uh, the case uh, in future. So this is, uh, this is uh, I think, an important point as well, because it means that um, the benefits uh, to society accrue not just over a 10 year time frame or a 30 year time frame, as, as we've looked at in the report, but they carry on accruing um, beyond that and into the longer term uh, as well. Um, and uh, thirdly, um, uh, well-being. Uh, now, clearly, um, this is a, an area which is it can be harder to measure. There, there are some you know, some pretty robust estimates uh, out there, and, and, and we've used those in terms of trying to quantify uh, well-being. Um, but the the manner through which uh, community-led homes are, are developed, you know, through the efforts uh, of volunteers and through engagement with communities, and then subsequently. Uh, with um, tenant uh, engagement um, and indeed um, tenant empowerment, although I'm, I'm not, not sure that it always extends as far as uh, machine gun posts and passport control, um, but clearly a, a big role um, for, um, for tenants uh, in, the, in the schemes that are subsequently developed. All this engagement, uh, all this volunteering um, brings with it um, benefits, not just to the broader community, but also the, to the individuals uh, themselves. The, there is a, a benefit um, which can be uh, quantified, has been quantified by, um, by others um, around the extent to which individuals uh, benefit in terms of their, their well-being um, from, uh, from their, their involvement. And, um, you know, just to put that into some perspective, from our, from our survey, we found that um, just over eight or between about eight and nine uh, people are, are involved as volunteers in bringing a project uh, to fruition. Um, and then once projects are, are up and running, um, around about three volunteers on average carry on um, uh, running them. Um, so there's a lot of people being involved uh, in order to um, deliver and run these homes. And, and of course, the uh, residents are engaged uh, as well. Um, and and all of that uh, activity is um, adding to, to well-being of, so of society, um, even if it's not showing up in, in measures of economic activity. Um, so it's important to broaden um, what we look at uh, when we're talking about value for money and the benefit to society of funding that is put into community-led housing. Um, okay, so just finally then, so just pulling those three parts together, and there's additionality, uh, affordability, uh, and well-being, um, and that all adds up to value for money uh, for public funding. Um, now, through the, the work that we've done, we've um, gathered evidence um, and we've followed um, a, a sort of framework that's used by government officials to assess value for money. Um, and we've, we've come to the conclusion that uh, depending on exactly what, which measure we use, which is explained in the report, um, the community-led housing sector delivers between medium and high value for money. Um, and just to give you some context around that, it means that for, uh, for each pound of public funds uh, that is um, invested in community-led housing, um, the sector is delivering between uh, about two and three pounds of uh, public benefit. Um, so there's a, in effect, there's a substantial return uh, for society um, from the funding of uh, community-led homes. Okay, thank you. Um, Grant, thank you very much, um, both for the guidance on pronouncing your surname, but actually more importantly, obviously, in terms of the outcomes of the research, and that was a really clear run through and it's a piece of work which was actually very complex, um, but as you say, really makes the case very strongly. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like now to hand over to uh, Tom Archer. Um, and Tom, I know you're going to talk to us and I'm going to ask you if you can keep it fairly brief in terms of the pipeline, not to underestimate just how important that information is, but as you'll appreciate, we are a bit short for time. So over awesome. to you, Tom. <laughs> um, our whistle stops off. 
Um, so as Grants has outlined, um, the, the community-led housing sector delivers significant benefits and that outweighs costs. And the extent of those benefits is not just about what we build, but how much of it we build. And that's really been the focus of, uh, of, of my work uh, over the last six months or so with the sector. Back in February, we produced an estimate uh, based on um, the best data we have about the projects in development to look at the grant requirements for those projects going forward. And that picture suggested at the time that there were as many as 23,000 units being planned. And we focused in on a subset of, the, of those where we had good information around the stage of development, their tenures, who was supporting them. And we used that to make some estimates of the requirement uh, for grant funding. We were conscious of just what an impact COVID-19 and the non-extension of the community housing fund may have had um, on that pipeline. So through the summer months, we were speaking to um, intermediaries on the ground that were supporting community-led housing groups to really get a picture of what might have changed. And that picture suggested very few projects had terminated, but there were kind of delays at certain stages. And we used that information to adjust our calculations on, on the grants, uh, grant requirements. So those updated grant requirements are that the, um, the, the community-led community housing sector needs around 29 to 53 million of revenue funding and between 100 and 146 million of capital funding. And it's that that's really formed the basis of um, the sector's uh, submission to uh, uh, the comprehensive spending review, where they've asked for a five-year fund totaling around, I think, 180 million um, Catherine might correct me on that, but um, that's essentially form the basis. There are two uncertainties to, to kind of focus on really quickly before I finish. The first is, you know, when you create these large um, grant funding programs, you stimulate a lot of new groups and a lot of new demand. So how that feeds through if a fund is created uh, is a really interesting question about the growth, how quickly the sector could grow, picking up on, uh, on Danny Kruger's point earlier about kind of scaling up. But we're in kind of uncertain economic times um, and the message uh, from the front line really is that projects at that later stage of development have continued to progress and I think many more can progress with the right funding um, and support uh, and bring those bring those homes to completion. John thank you very much and that was very succinct and <laughs> thank you for that too. <laughs> Um, and I'd just like to underline actually that point that yeah, this is about capital and revenue funding and that ongoing pipeline is absolute, the revenue funding is absolutely critical because that keeps the ball rolling um, and keeps us being able to support other communities actually to take advantage of community-led housing and all the benefits that we've heard come from that. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm going to ask for some very initial refle reflections and actually we were going to ask Danny first given that you you started off with setting the context if you could just keep this quite short in terms of the reflections that you've had in terms of what you've heard and then I'll come to a couple of other people that I know are going to um, make some comments as well which would be helpful but just before Danny you start can I just ask everybody, um, you know, if you do have some questions or comments that you want to put in, do use the chat line in order to do so, so that um, Catherine can respond to those at the end. Right, so Danny, can I hand what? over to you? Just yeah, but, yeah I'll, be very, I'll be very quick, thank you for that. Um, I mean, I, th I think that the focus on wellbeing is important and interesting. It'd be a challenge to get the Treasury to accept, of course, but um, there is, that is now an increasing recognition in government and there's, you know, there are government measures around that. Um, so this is all grist to that mill. Uh, of course, the social capital that you're trying to measure as an outcome from this work is really the input that delivers the additionality. So it's because there is capital, social capital, there is trust in a community. People are prepared to put in that persistence um, and that, you know, use that local knowledge um, that, um, that, that, that is the real source of the, 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 you know, the impetus for these things. But for that, in order to generate that, investment of people's time and energy we need the certainty which is why what i greatly regret and we you know we're in uncertain economic times but it's greatly regrettable when government can't mitigate that by putting in place long-term funding that people can believe will will uh, remain and there's hope at the end of the, all this work that they put in um 
you, you, you'll go around so many interesting people, some, many of whom I've, I've come across before. I mean, Richard Bacon is the great hero and expert on this in the House of Commons. So I'd be very grateful to hear his views on how we actually might move this along, given the political opportunity we've got. But very interested to hear what everyone's got to say. Thank you. And uh, yes, that's a perfect introduction. Thank you. So, um, uh, Richard uh, Bacon, I saw, saw that you were on my screen a little while ago. So would you like to offer your um, comments? Well, first of all, um, thank you for hosting this. And there were so many good ideas that I will keep this extremely quick. But Danny is right that there is a revolution going on. The model is breaking down. I don't know if you can see this. It's a photograph of Metfield stores in Metfield, just south of the border in Suffolk, where I often drive because I have some storage down there, run by the community for the community. This has come from the bottom up because people wanted a local shop, even though traditional economics might not make it work. It's not part of necessarily the purely economic case, but it's certainly part of the social capital of that village and what keeps it going. And it's a delight to go in there um, and, and one meets people. Um, I, I completely get the point and I think it's great that the uh, uh, the CLT has done this work with capital economics. That's exactly the sort of research and work one needs to do. One needs to place this in, in terms of um, the economic case in its broadest sense. Bear in mind that when government wants to do something which only has a benefit cost ratio of 1.0001, it'll do it if it wants to badly enough. It's called HS2. Um, and uh, we mustn't forget, even though it's right to talk in this language, that there is a big political case, and that's partly for people like me and Danny to make that case, but I think it's actually down to everybody. And it comes back to something Joe was saying right at the beginning of the very many good points you made about why we should be doing more of this, Joe. One of them was about overcoming local opposition. And many of my colleagues, I don't think, seem to have asked themselves the question, why is it that there is so much opposition? Is it because we don't want everyone to have somewhere live to live? Plainly not. It's because of what the it is that gets done. And the way to change local opposition into local acceptance is to change the it of what gets done and the best way to do that is to involve people to involve local communities and to actually give them a proper voice as to what gets done where it gets done what it looks like what its thermal performance is like what it costs and crucially who gets the first chance to live there you change all that you can change everything and finally you know housing diversification which involves clt as well as the national custom self-build federation and the federation of master builders uh, national custom self-build association FMB and the UK Goes Housing Network, reckon we could get an extra 130,000 houses in the next uh, five years if the government just keeps its promises. And I'm certain that Danny will, and I will too, be pressing government very hard to do that. And as for this final point about value for money, the idea that spending 74% of government housing spend on housing benefit or subsidising demand to increase demand without increasing supply has anything to do with value for money is so obviously such intellectual garbage that we need to be stomping all over that with everything we've got to make sure people understand the old model has broken down, broken down. The new model, when it comes and as it's coming, is being done by people on the ground. It won't come from Whitehall. It's we have to persuade Whitehall that they've got to take notice. Richard, thank you. I would like to bottle your passion and enthusiasm. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. And I understand that the uh, minister has now uh, arrived. Um, so I'm going to um, delay the other people who I know would like to make some comments and reflections and invite the Minister um, to, to make his presentation. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the uh, CLT Network's um, Zoom conference uh, today. I'm sorry that, uh, well, I'm sorry on a number of uh, occasions. The first occasion is that we're having to do it in this rather um, inappropriate two-dimensional format. Um, I'm sorry that I'm rather sandwiched in between one meeting which I've just come from uh, on uh, the COVID emergency and another meeting I need to go to very shortly on our planning white paper but I did want to, to join this call. Um, in fact the last thing I did in the House of Commons before we had the lockdown was to uh, respond to Richard's adjournment debate on the Community Housing Fund and the importance of community build and self-build and I quite agree with you. Uh, we don't just need to bottle Richard's passion, we need to uncork it and that of Danny <laughs> as well. Both of them were in the chamber that evening uh, only six months ago. What I wanted to say was um, we have seen I think an incomplete uh, version of Capital Economics report. So I think seeing the final version as published will be very useful in our discussions with the 
Treasury. Uh, Richard will have heard me say before, and it's only half a joke, that uh, even though not all good ideas necessarily start in the Treasury, all good ideas can end in the Treasury if the Treasury doesn't like them. So it's very important we're able to sell um, the community and self-build proposition. I happen to think that it can play a very significant part in the build-out commitments that we have made as part of our election manifesto and subsequently in the Prime Minister's speech back in June when he said he wanted to build, build, build and build better. I think the um, CHF uh, over the 18 months or so that it was um, uh, working uh, through Homes England produced a pipeline of something like 11,000 additional homes for that pipeline. I should like to see them uh, come to fruition, which is why we need to uh, continue to work uh, with a value for money uh, frame of mind to see what we can do to uh, continue uh, the CHF. Because not only will that help uh, smaller communities uh, develop smaller packages of land, which generally has um, a better effect on uh, villages. Uh, it takes the weight off uh, uh, a desire to build in the um, more greener parts of communities. It means that you will get more innovative uh, designs of properties, which is all to the good because not everybody wants to uh, buy a Ford Mondeo, so to speak. People want different designs and the opportunity to design their own properties. It also helps uh, SMEs, as SMEs will be disproportionately benefited uh, from um, community and self-built projects. So I would like to see uh, the work uh, that you have done and are doing uh, continue. I hope, as Richard has said, and trust that it is captured in the white paper that we launched in the middle of August and which we're consulting upon now and I hope that we'll get as many inputs to it as possible before the consultation closes on the 29th of October because it's really important I think that we uh, focus this white paper on upfront strategic planning, uh, democratic empowerment, communities deciding what they want their entire community to look like rather than tactical rear guard planning action once individual planning applications are, are put down. And I think that community-led house building can play a significant part in persuading communities of the uh, importance uh, of our proposals and the validity of them in so far as they're designed to support uh, local communities and democratically empowering those communities. So I would say to Richard, to Danny, to all of you listening, more power to your elbow. Um, I look forward to further discussions with the Treasury as we uh, develop our proposals for the spending review and I look forward to further opportunities uh, such as the one that you've given me uh, this morning but I rather hope that we'll be able to do it in person uh, and not uh, in this uh, rather unsatisfactory two-dimensional Zoom format when people use far more words than they need to uh, and meetings tend to go on for much longer than they ought. So I'm going to shut up now and listen to what everybody has to say for five minutes before I then need to run away. Um, Minister, thank you very much. And, and that was encouraging. Um, and we appreciate your, your interest um, and support for this. And yes, you know, just to underline, you know, this is something where communities, whether urban or rural, can get involved up front and deliver something which benefits their, their community. So thank you. Um, so I'd just like then to open again um, the discussion and I know that uh, Lord Best I think was um, hoping to be here to give us some reflections and I did see <laughs> again him on screen earlier so uh, Lord Best can I hand over to you please? Yes absolutely Joe. Th thank you and I take that from the Minister as, as a pretty good uh, a yes to whether or not we should restart the, the CHF uh, once again. I think if you've got the Housing Minister on your side, even if Treasury is a bit reluctant, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big start. So that's great, great to be part of hearing that. Like Danny, I, I, I've been a fan of CLTs for, from, from the start. This, this takes me back 
to the early days of all these now vast housing associations with, uh, with tens of thousands of properties. This is where they all started. They embodied a whole set of values. We called this the voluntary housing movement back in the 60s and 70s when I was first in, engaged in all of this, the voluntary housing movement. And it has become now a very professional, a big scale operation. Thank goodness it has, because it provides thousands of homes, but of course it loses something in the process. And CLTs have, have retained and embodied that community spirit, uh, that, uh, that motivation, the, the use of volunteers. Uh, it, this, this is really the heart of where social housing has been and, and should remain. Now, I, I hope, this is my little, little message uh, to the CLT network and the, and, the, and the sector, my hope is that we can combine the strengths of community engagement, the, the, the whole way that CLTs operate and bring people together, with the strengths of the now much, much larger established housing associations who've got the professionalism, who've got the financial clout, because the two can work together. Those, those, three, uh, those three characteristics that Grant uh, Calhoun, Calhoun uh, 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 set out for us, additionality, affordability, well-being, just what, what we need to inject into the sector. Uh, that combination, finding the sites, overcoming local opposition, uh, helping line the thing up and provide that volunteer backing. This is fantastic stuff. And that in combination with the strengths of the big housing associations is I think the future. Uh, I know this is already happening. Uh, Places for People, a very, a very big player, is now working with CLTs, Aster, Stonewater, uh, Kathy Bakewell and I opened a Hasto scheme where Hasto Housing Association worked with a local CLT in Powerstock uh, last year. Absolutely fantastic scheme, doing all the right things, producing beautiful buildings, sustainable buildings, just what we all want. This combination, I think, is the secret. So. Uh, congratulations to the network, to the CLTs that are getting going. Of course, we need the CHF fund to be restarted. And thank you, Christopher, for, for being behind that. I'm sure you will be very supportive of that in the discussions that now follow on the CSR. Congratulations to all. You are the, the motivation, uh, that uh, community ingredient that the rest of the sector so badly needs. Uh, hang in there and make it happen. Thank you. <laughs> Richard, thank you very much and is ever supportive and we really appreciate that over all the time <laughs> that, that you have supported this work and long may it continue. Um, I'd now like to um, hand over to um, Lee Pierce, uh, Chief Executive of the Nationwide Foundation um, and again thank you for your contribution to making this happen. So uh, Lee, over to you. Thank you, um, it's a pleasure. So at the Nationwide Foundation, we've been committed to supporting community-led house -led housing for well over a decade. Um, and during this time, we've enjoyed working with the National CLT Network, whose knowledge and expertise we hold in very high regard. And over the last however many years, probably more than I care to remember, that we've been working in this sector, we have seen with our own eyes the value that community-led housing brings to the families that live in the homes, to the local SMEs that are involved in the development of the homes and the community more widely. And there is evidence to support all of those points. But we've also believed that community-led housing is good value for money. And until now, the case for that hadn't been tested fully. So we're delighted to have had the opportunity to fund this robust and independent research alongside Power to Change to test those assumptions and provide the evidence um, about the value for money that community-led housing provides ahead of the comprehensive spending review. One of the joys of this research is just how clear the findings are and how easy it is to draw conclusions from, the, from it, um, which isn't always a characteristic of research. Um, so well done and thank you to Capital Economics. And the points that I've drawn from the research um, are the same ones that others have talked about today, but they are points that are worth repeating. We're especially pleased that the evidence has shown that when using public funds, community-led housing represents good value for money. 
Another finding that stands out to me is that community-led housing leads to additional supply by unblocking sites. And this is a tenant com um, common across all community-led housing groups and something that we have seen happen again and again. More homes are built because of community-led housing. And we all know that demand for such homes outweighs supply and creating homes is a key way to build back better. So with this evidence, the government can move forward into the comprehensive spending review with confidence, sound in the knowledge that choosing to relaunch the community housing fund will mean that public money will be well used and will create lasting benefits across the country. So we have clear evidence that not only does community-led housing provide the homes that people want in the places they're needed at the prices they can truly afford, but importantly, it has proven to be a really wise investment for the public purse. So to those that have the ear of Treasury, please use this research to spread that message. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I think that's a, a good summary and, and perfect. Thank you. And so can I now um, in, ask um, Joe Shalom, uh, who's the Head of Financial Inclusion um, at the Research and, and Policy, um, sorry, <laughs> Financial Inclusion and Housing at the Centre for Social Justice uh, for, for your views. Sure, thanks very much, Joe, and sorry for the uh, apologies for the mouthful of a job title and uh, organisation. Um, but it's, it's worth me saying, first of all, that the CSJ, uh, we've got a network of small charities across the country. And so I've, um, I've really seen firsthand the kind of impact that community led housing schemes can have on, um, you know, very disadvantaged communities, but individuals giving them that independence. Um, while also helping to, you know, tackle the, the, the housing challenges that we face as a nation. So we're big advocates for the model. Um, but I suppose I'd make a couple of quick reflections just that situate this in the kind of wider housing policy picture, because I think that, you know, the value for money um, point that's been made very resoundingly by this research, we knew intuitively, it's great we've got something to show the Treasury, but it's also worth saying that actually what we're doing with community-led housing is diversifying the supply um, in, in the housing sector. And I think this is going to be so important when we're making the case um, and talking about build out and actually accelerating the build out of homes by by diversifying um, that supply. So the government really should be reaching for every weapon in the arsenal there so we, so we can you know in, accelerate the build out on existing sites. I think the second key takeaway I, I had was that you know this is really about doing housing with the community as opposed to doing it unto the community and I think there's lessons there for the wider planning reforms as they're being formulated. I think, you know, as we've heard, a lot of the strengths of the model is about really getting that community buy-in. And actually, we know from um, some of the findings of the Building Better Commission and other work that we've done previously, that actually bringing on board local people through those locally designed uh, design codes is, is really a way of, of, of stopping that resistance, that's stopping development. And so there's lots of lessons there that can be taken further. But I think the final um, sort of key takeaway for me from all this is that it really shows that housing can be a key part of the sort of social infrastructure that the government is using to achieve uh, and strive for those kind of wider aims of spreading opportunity and leveling up and i think there are things that i mean lord best touched on this that actually we can borrow from the clt model to expand more widely into um, housing policy to achieve some of those strategic aims you know thinking about the the children that are growing up tonight in temporary accommodation taking forward um, a housing programme much more strategically, I think is going to be so important for this government if it is to achieve those ambitions. And by looking at community-led approaches and borrowing from that with, a, you know, with the more structured kind of infrastructure that we have you know, through housing associations and councils um, is something that we'd be really keen to see. So thank you very much. Joe, thank you. And I'd just like to underline that point about you know, this is about an inclusive way of including different parts, different parts of a uh, community who otherwise often haven't had a voice. And we've seen that particularly in some of the urban regeneration community-led housing schemes. And I think that's something we really shouldn't lose sight of. So thank you, Joe. Um, I'd like now to um, hand over to Alva Magnabola, um, oh, who's head of research on to change. I, I'll be super brief because I can see how little time we have left. Um, I mean, Power to Change, we're obviously great supporters of community housing, and I won't go into that in any, any detail. But since we were established in 2015, um, 
And actually, since 2017, when we started really investing in this sector, we've put about four million in to supporting community led housing. Um, and the government's community housing fund has been hugely important in growing that sector and growing that pipeline, because obviously there's only so much that a funder like us can do, despite our resources. Um, so it's very important for others to recognise that and come on board. And I think one point I would make, um, going back to what Danny said about talking to the Treasury, but I think it's really, so evidence is really important to us. We try and make our decisions and our funding decisions based on the evidence. And what we've always felt was missing was this value for money evidence around community housing. And what the study today has shown is that even when you take the wellbeing benefit out, if you sort of are in the Treasury, you discount that and you're not very convinced, um, the sort of, the narrow range of benefits still gives you almost two pounds for every pound benefit. So I think this is, you know, really solid evidence that we really should be pushing hard towards Treasury to talk about the, um, the value for money benefit here. And it's not, it's not just the well-being, and I'm not discounting well-being in any way, but it's, it's very important. Um, Catherine, I think you probably want to do some Q&A, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> Alba, thank you very much. And yes, I've sort of been sneaking a look at the, the chat and comments that are going on. And I know that Catherine and Sophie have been sort of pulling it together. So I'm going to hand over to them now. Um, because I know that they're going to invite other people to um, to voice their views, which would be really helpful and interesting to hear. So over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much, Joe, and thanks so much, everybody, for your fantastic contributions to this discussion. Um, there have been some really great questions that have come in. I'm really conscious as well of time, so I'm going to limit it to two questions. Um, a few came up about the blockages with Treasury. So this is a question for Danny. Um, what can we do to convince Treasury the worth of investing in this sector. Danny, you still there? Yeah, yeah sorry, I was just trying to get off mute. Um, well, I mean, the, the good news is there is a willingness to listen at the moment. Uh, there's an appetite for big ideas. There's a recognition, as I said, about um, the importance of placemaking and of consent as a principle of the house building uh, revolution that's needed. So I think feeding into the white paper consultation that's going on uh, is one, one, one way. I mean, that's through MHCLG, but it'll, it'll get to Treasury and it'll bolster Robert Jenrick's hand making these cases. Very, I was very encouraged by Chris Pincher as well. Uh, and that, that was, I think, as warm uh, a commitment he's made publicly up till now. So that's good. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thing is, I mean, for, for economists among us, which doesn't include me, uh, there is a great review of the Green Book going on about the way the Treasury calculates uh, value for money and spending decisions. And, you know, it's part of the levelling up agenda to reprioritise investment into places that, according to traditional Treasury models, don't give as much value for money as, you know, big, big infrastructure projects in the southeast. So I think as part of that, we should be thinking, encouraging them to think about the points that are made in the research, um, including around well-being. So I, I'd say through the white paper, uh, spending review underway and the Green Book uh, review. There are there's a there's a you know the government's listening, uh, but you know and and finally just through your local um, through through local MPs. The more MPs I can see another couple of MPs on the call, so that's excellent. I just think if the more of us that are uh, talking about this publicly and privately, the better. Thanks so much, Danny. That's really really helpful. Um, there was another question that seems very appropriate given the mention of the planning white paper. It's from Carol Riley at Locality about whether we can safe, if we can have reassurances about safeguarding some of the powers in neighbour planning. Carol, would you like to tell your, ask your question? Thank you, Catherine. I won't ask it because it's really long, but just um, it, this is brilliant and well done to everyone at CLT and for getting everyone together. And it's great to see the minister here. It's great to see you here, Danny and you, Richard. But I suppose what we're concerned about when we look at the white paper is that it's focusing on design. And I think the fundamental thing that we've talked about in both um, community land trusts, all the types of community led housing and neighbourhood planning is the strength of community engagement and the vehicles for delivering that. And the evidence we have is ex numbers in excess of local plan numbers, absolutely. Communities want to allocate their own sites, there's little ones developers aren't interested in. So we're worried about the white paper not really just focusing on design essentially then i'll cut it there thanks carol um danny do you would you like to come back on that actually if you've got anything to mention well personally i quite like to that's a very interesting point and I'd, if you want to 
Carol, if you want to send anything uh, over, I, I can try and lobby for that directly. That's a, it's a very powerful point and I completely agree. Thanks so much. I'm really sorry we haven't had more time for Q&A, but there's some really great questions that came up in the chat and we'll try and address that, make sure that we address them uh, through our work. And if there's anything that you've raised that we can answer, we'll obviously follow up with you directly. Um, I'd like to now hand back to Danny. <laughs> sorry, Danny, this will be the Danny show. Oh. Um, <laughs> to do uh, to sort of do the final uh, okay. closing. well i mean I, I mean thank you Catherine. you you yourself and your organization has been really really helpful to me uh in helping to understand this and i'm delighted that this research has been done I echo everything that people are saying really feel given that we're in the middle of an economic crisis given the community housing fund is sort of on its back uh given the distractions of everything else that's going on given that the white paper as we just heard isn't perfect in in, in recognizing the, the uh, centrality of community-led housing given all of these problems i'm very encouraged by the conversation we've had and the sense of possibility that we all have and i think if we do pull together and i do want to echo or to repeat myself that I, I think the way you work uh the clt network and across the whole community housing sector working together and in a very sort of positive way and it doesn't feel like you're sort of aggressive you know uh, anti-government lobbyists or anything I've, i'm really encouraged by the spirit in which you do i think so so you know for, for the you are revolutionaries uh trying to blow up the system but you do it in a really good conservative way uh so i applaud that spirit and tone and and, and the way the way you work so just more more of that and please do get give me as much ammo as you can to uh, to make the case, and I, I mean, I just tuck in behind Richard Bacon in, in general. Um, but anything we can do, uh, I'm keen to. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, so this is just to say thank you for, to all of you for joining this really, really great discussion today. Um, I'm going to follow up with everybody um, with the report, so you can all see it in full, um, as well as our CSR submission especially just a kind of bit of a request to all the MPs and officials and advisors and influencers, which most of you are, um, if you could then share that report and our CSR submission for the people who need to hear it, that would be really, really appreciated, um, especially with Treasury. Thank you. Thanks again, um, and I hope you have a really great rest of the day, and especially thanks to Joe for sharing today. She did a fantastic job. Thank you. <laughs>